this a good? All right, here we go. So in the, in the beginning, there was servers, physical servers. Then we had virtual machines, containers, and now we have serverless functions. So serverless functions, the end of evolution, there will be no further technology after serverless functions <laughs> because they solve every problem we've ever had. They're small units of compute, they're easy to use, they're easy to manage. And it's not just Lambda that is serverless computing. There's all of these other services, right? Serverless computing is, is any, any of these services, any of these APIs where somebody else is managing everything for you. And you can mix and match them. You can have you know, some of your stuff on Lambda and some of it on S3 and some of it over at that image hosting service and some of it at that text hosting service and the comments service. The point is you don't own any of it. So I'm mostly gonna focus on the Amazon ecosystem today, but that's, you know, like I said, that's not the only thing there is. So what is serverless anyway? Basically, the point of serverless is there's still servers, obviously, but you don't control them. So you don't have to manage them, you don't have to optimize them, but you also don't get the choice. And really, the whole point of serverless computing is this idea of, of speeding up development by getting out of the developer's way. It's, it's uh, you know, removing the overhead, the management overhead. But what does that mean for those of us who actually have to manage this stuff? That's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So, you know, back in the day, you would have your single development pipeline, everybody would check their code in, and it would uh, run the tests and deploy. This is, of course, if you had a CI CD pipeline, maybe you weren't even that far along. And, you know, this is kind of a pain for the developers, but it was great for us who have to manage this stuff because at least you ha it was consistent and you kind of knew it was gonna happen. Then came along the trend of having these multiple pipelines, microservices, everything like that. So you've got a bunch of developers working on different code branches, different repositories, com committing to them, deploying, but in the end you had one solid product and at least everybody was still kind of coming through the same pipeline. Maybe it was multiple pipelines, but probably at least the same systems or it was, you know, you could at least kind of figure out what was going on. But now we have the serverless environment. So we've got developers who can deploy to Lambda, they can deploy to these third party services, they can set up their own pipelines. And so, you know, this is great for the developer, it's super easy for them to get moving, but it's a pain in the butt for people who have to manage all of this stuff because you don't know where they're deploying to, you don't know how they're doing it, you don't know how they've configured it, how they've set it up, or anything like that. And this, you know, the, the standard microservices pattern, right, everybody kind of moves through this eventually, uh, for the most part. There are still some monoliths out there. But there's a lot of advantages to the microservices. There's the, the distributed work t uh, workforce and the contracts or APIs between them and everything is loosely coupled. So that's really nice, right? You don't have to have everybody in the same page and so that's the, the joy of serverless and the pain of serverless. So we all probably familiar with the typical microservices architecture, uh, you know, and the standard microservices tools, right? We've got the servers and the frameworks and all of that stuff. And now, what do all of those things have in common, right? These servers. This idea of you have to manage these servers, which means you have to deal with all of these things like utilization and capacity planning and all of that. And in the serverless world, that all goes away. You don't have to deal with any of that stuff. You don't get to deal with any of that stuff. And in theory, it's beautiful and wonderful and fully managed. But that's really not true. There's still all of these other things that you still have to deal with, regardless of whether they're servers or not, right? There's still queues, there's still monitoring, there's still deployment, there's alerting, there's how do we make a reliable system? And so, as the DevOps engineer, your job is still to be the expert on building reliable systems. It's still your job to make sure that even if all of these people are deploying to all of these different places, they're doing it in a way that makes sense, that works well together, and so on. And in a serverless world, all of those problems that you have with microservices are 10x worse. What do I mean by that? I mean, basically, with all of these people deploying everywhere, with different configuration systems, in all the different ways, you, it, everything about microservices that sucks that makes them hard to manage is 10x worse. So let's quickly talk about some of the example serverless use cases. So uh, raise your hands, how many people are using Lambda in their production environment? Okay, 
And how about anything else that would be considered serverless? So you basically have a third party in the line of production. Okay, so not a lot of you. So let me throw out a few use cases here that might actually convince you that using Lambda or something like it is, a, how many of you are on AWS? Oh, actually, wow, that's a surprisingly low number, actually. Uh, so, okay, I guess the rest of you are self-hosting. Now I'm kind of curious, I'll ask you later. <laughs> so some good use cases for uh, using serverless is basically, well, one is the application backend, which I'm gonna talk about a lot in a second, but also uh, data processing, and pretty much any time you have one of those tools boxes, how many of you have a box called tools? No? Oh, that used, like, everybody used to raise their hands. Well, I'm sure you have a box where you like run all those stupid little scripts that do that thing on a cron job, right? Those are all perfect use cases for something like Lambda or serverless. They can be run, you don't have to have that server that's that one-off server that's the cron job that runs all of the other things to make all of your other not one-off servers work well. And so, you know, there's lots of other use cases around serverless, like this one, uh, you know, of live video stream processing, where you've got a bunch of different functions doing different things. The important thing to highlight here is the fact that one of these services is not running on Amazon, so this is a third-party image hosting service. Uh, another example is static website hosting. So there's services that'll host your static website, so maybe you wanna have some dynamic content or something like that, so you can split it up that way. So what, is, what does Lambda do for you, right? So Lambda is sort of the canonical serverless type of environment. So what do they do? They manage server capacity, uh, they make sure that the functions are executed, they handle some logging, some monitoring, so you know, they handle some stuff for you. This is their monitoring, it's pretty basic, it just says how often things are running and how slow or fast they're moving. And how do you use Lambda? So not a lot of you have done it, so I'll explain it real quickly. Uh, basically, you have to write your code. Uh, they give you uh, SDK, you can use uh, Java, Python, uh, there's ways to use other languages as well with a shim. Then you have to choose the source that triggers that function, so the functions don't just run, uh, you have to trigger them. Uh, you can trigger them with CloudWatch triggers, though, that are like cron, uh, or a bunch of other different things. You have to choose the network that they're gonna run under, whether it's gonna be a private network or the regular network and how that ties into the rest of your systems. And then finally, you have to use Amazon's wonderful interface to deploy. Uh, if any of you have ever used the Amazon console, you know how excellent and easy it is to deploy things with the Amazon console. <laughs> uh, so these are all the things you have to do, right? You can do them through the console or you can use a library. So our company has built all of our stuff on Lambda. So basically everything we do is on serverless, on Lambda. And so we started by building an open source library to manage all of that. Uh, this is actually written by the same person who wrote Bodo. So if you're familiar with using Python and AWS, then you're probably already familiar with it. Uh, and so we wrote this. There's other uh, libraries out there I'll talk about in just a second. But I wanna give you a quick example of what that code does and how it works. So I wrote a quick little word generator. As a company founder, one of my jobs is to come up with product names and company names, and I hate doing both of those things. So of course, being an engineer, I wrote a program to do it. Uh, I wrote this little program where you can give it a prefix or a suffix uh, and say generate English looking words using a database from Google of English type uh, engrams. So this is uh, what this code structure looks like. Uh, the important thing here is that YAML file, and so that YAML file lets you specify things like the profile, it lets you specify the uh, permissions, and it, you can go pretty deep into the permissions and specifications, also the timeouts, the memory, et cetera. So WordGen itself is actually very simple. It basically just calls another function that says go and grab the data uh, and pull it out. There's a test file that just looks like that. It's just JSON with some arguments, and then this is the actual database. And so the database file is actually put right in there. It's a SQLite database, and it is uploaded with the function. So it gets uploaded every time. This will be relevant in just a minute. So it's really easy to do this deployment. You just say cap deploy, and it takes care of all of that crap that I mentioned for you, right? It creates the roles, uh, it zips everything up, it uploads it, 
uh, and it does all of that other stuff. And so you can see there how it deployed and it created all those roles, et cetera. Uh, and then we can easily invoke the tests. So we just say invoke, that's the JSON file. All it does is call the function with that JSON and we get our results back. Uh, I really like that, uh, that second, third one there, OpSender. That's a cool name, so free company name for anyone who wants it, or product name. And so now let's go and edit our JSON file and ask it to generate 20 words instead of 10. So we quickly change our file and we invoke our test again. Uh, and then we wait and we wait and we see that, oh no, it timed out, there was an error. So the default is three seconds. So we'll go in and we'll edit the, uh, the Kappa file. We'll change the default timeout to 30 seconds and then we will redeploy. And what you'll notice during the redeployment uh, is that it is smart about the redeployment. It says the function didn't change, so I don't need to up change the function. All I have to do is change the configuration. <laughs> and so you can see here that's uh, all, that's weird. Well, that arrow, oh, there it goes. <laughs> uh, so all it did was uh, change the uh, configuration and that's it. So, you know, it's pretty smart uh, and it does uh, some good, cool stuff like that. And then uh, you can see that after we run it again, uh, it took four seconds greater than the timeout and it created some other cool ops names down there. And that's all on my GitHub, so if you want, you can run that yourself. So there's a bunch of uh, different ways to manage. There's libraries for this. They all kind of work the same way. Uh, there's Apex, which you may have heard of. Uh, Apex works almost exactly the same way as Kappa does. The, the command lines are slightly different. Uh, Apex does let you do a bunch of other languages, though. So they'll shove in a JavaScript shim that lets you run pretty much any language that exists on the Lambda container, which is kind of nice. Uh, serverless uses uh, cloud formation. So if you have a lot of other infrastructure, serverless framework is really nice because it ties in very nicely with your other uh, infrastructure. Or if you're running, uh, if you're using Terraform, Apex ties in directly to Terraform. So basically, you know, if, if you're gonna do just Python on AWS, Kappa is probably gonna be a good choice. But if you wanna do other languages or intermix with other infrastructure, Apex is really cool. I've used that one as well. So this is the architecture of our actual product. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated. It's a Slack bot, so we have to run a ECS container to maintain our connection to Slack because they require a long pole connection, a WebSocket. Uh, but basically the way it works is we maintain that connection. Uh, somebody types something in chat, it comes in to ECS, that fires off to a routing function in Lambda, uh, which fires off to other Lambdas, uh, which may or may not generate data and send that data back and forth. The request goes back. And then it generates you know, an SNS to send back and a Kinesis log line. So that's the basic architecture of our uh, system. So router.py, what does that look like? Router.py is fairly simple. Uh, it just says, here's how you call other functions. So this is one of those nice parts that micro, uh, of microservices that you don't have to worry about is discovery, service discovery. How do I find the other services to call? It's just sort of taking care of for you with Lambda because you can call functions by name. So you can alias the functions, you can call them by name, uh, and you can do it right here in your code, which makes it really easy to do service discovery. You don't have to worry about a library or anything like that. Uh, and this also lets you do your uh, red, black deployment, blue, green, whatever you call it. Uh, this idea of we have two running, two live pieces of live code. Uh, we have the current and we have the future and we shift the traffic to the future to see how it's working so we can rapidly shift back. You basically just shim that right into your own code. Now, at this point, you might start to see the problem. I'll, every one of your developers might do this slightly differently. So this is one of those problems that you now have to solve that's multiplied 10x by, uh, from microservices. In microservices, chances are you gave them a library to do this. <laughs> Now that you're gonna have to give them a chunk of code and hope that they include that and so on. <clears throat> so here's an example of deploying uh, functionality. So somebody types something in, it doesn't work. So I quickly go in and you know, edit my file and upload it. I run the Kappa deploy. 
it does this, its little thing there where it deploys, and then it's supported in dev. Yay, super simple, right? I changed one file and hit deploy and it was great. Uh, and then as a developer, I can go through and I can push up my changes. Uh, GitHub has that handy pull request thing that you probably used. I'm an extreme developer, so I'm gonna approve my own pull request. And now you start to see the problem again, right? I've just, in five minutes basically, I've deployed new functionality to production, and the only clue anyone has that I did this is the fact that I did a git check-in. Uh, and that's the only clue there is. There's no log of the deployment or anything like that because it all came out of my laptop. So yay for a developer, production of pro in five minutes, but sucks for the person who has to ma manage that and make sure that it works. Uh, so the deployment for Kappa looks like that. Now, how do we solve these problems? Well, <coughs> we have the code base structure here. So we've got all of these YAML files. Uh, we've got some extra JSON configuration files. Uh, those are like environment variables, basically. Uh, and we have our artifacts. And the only way right now that I know of to do this is to sort of scan all of this, basically check it all back out and scan through it and look for these problems. And that is unfortunately the current state of the art in managing serverless infrastructure. So the bad news I have for you today is there aren't a lot of solutions that I can offer you today because there, there just aren't a lot of solutions that exist. So <clears throat> what I will ask you now and again is if you have solutions, please share them because so I'm gonna tell you all of the problems we have and hopefully next year I can come back here and we can talk about solutions to these problems because unfortunately there just aren't a lot right now. The good news though is that it means that serverless isn't making our jobs go away today. Maybe we'll have a good year or two left before we're completely useless to developers. So you'll notice here that this is the file sizes of all of the functions. So this, the way we've laid out our code is every Lambda function gets its own little repository. And you notice those first three are significantly larger. I'll come back to that in a second because the other big question, debate that a lot of people have is how many repos should I even have? Some people wanna have one repo for every single function, which is very nice and granular, but very hard to maintain. Some people choose one mega repo for all the functions. Uh, we've sort of compromised, and we have a front-end repo and a back-end repo uh, and a website. So we, because typically when you're editing front-end functionality, you're gonna end up modifying more than one function at a time. So it's handy to have those in one place to make pull requests, but we still have to deal with the issues of when we make a back-end change or a front-end change that requires a back-end change, it requires two pull requests. You can reference them to each other, but that's difficult. So we're still actually trying to figure out what the best methodology here is around repos. It's actually looking like probably the best methodology is a single massive repo. But uh, the important thing to note here is that uh, Lambda lets you manage your code and your infrastructure in one place. Or if you're the person who asks to actually manage that stuff, it means that your developers get to manage your infrastructure and do whatever they want to it without you really having any control over it. So how do we at least regain some of the control? How do we at least have some semblance of I actually know what's going on? Well, uh, the one, one way to do that is through immutable data. So this is a standard distributed systems uh, architecture, right, is the more immutable data you have, the better. Uh, the nice thing about immutable data is that it doesn't matter what the cache state is and it, uh, you can see all the changes to it because there's typically you know, one after the next after the next, so you get a log. So this at least helps a little bit in any distributed system, particularly in one of these distributed systems where the data can be distributed over lots of different places and maybe you can't even do a cache invalidation because some of that cache is stored on some third party server. Uh, because in a distributed system, moving data is gonna be the biggest cost of your distributed system, greater than any other cost. But for uh, reliability, you uh, need to make that trade off. So uh, my best suggestion is to use queues as often as possible. Uh, and I do like to go on a very quick uh, side note about queues. So queues uh, store anything you write in a database, 
you get some great insight out of it. But let's look at this graph, right? Here's a graph of Q depth. What happened? What went wrong? Did things come in too quickly or did things not get processed fast enough? So if you take nothing else away from this talk, I want you to go look up cumulative flow diagram. So if you have any queues, this is the best way you can monitor them. So this tells you how many things have arrived and left. And by looking at this, you can immediately tell that the problem was, uh, was slowness in processing. So inbound rate stayed the same, outbound rate was uh, poor. And the reason it's cumulative is because if you don't do it cumulative, it looks like this, which is effectively useless. So some other tips and tricks with, the, with serverless that we've run into, uh, limit your function size. So every time you make a change, you have to re-upload your function to the service, which means the bigger it is, the longer it takes. And worse off, if you're using this particularly Java, uh, JVM startup time is actually gonna be a big concern. Uh, remember that execution is asynchronous, so again, queues will help you solve this. Uh, and so on the back end of these serverless systems, typically what they're doing is managing containers for you. So uh, you know you want to, uh, they're gonna manage the containers, you wanna know that those containers exist and try to take advantage of the reuse of containers. Uh, but you also have to remember that there is some temp storage, but you can't rely on it ever existing from one invocation to the next. But you can rely on it for uh, one, to potentially exist. So this is again where that immutable data comes in handy, right? If you throw some immutable data into temp, it happens to be available for the next invocation of the function, that'll speed things up, but you don't have to worry about invalidating it or whether it'll be there or not. So it's kind of like a nice little local cache that you can sometimes rely on. Uh, the function aliases, as I mentioned, are great ways to handle uh, you know, routing, so you can use function aliases with prod and dev, for example, so you don't even need to have two separate environments. Uh, you can use version one, version two, version three, so you can have your code point at a particular version of a function. Uh, so there's lots of uses for these aliases. Uh, so they exist, make sure you use them. Make sure you're using the included logger. Uh, it has a lot of good information, but you do have to process it. Uh, okay. Uh, make sure you uh, set up all of your alarms on uh, Lambda and CloudWatch. So we got bit by that by not keeping track of failed executions, things like that. Uh, one trick to avoid some throttling if you are using Amazon is to use their queuing service because their queuing service has much higher throttles. Or, or I should say data coming in from their queue has a much higher throttle than coming directly. So if you try to send data directly from one service to another, it has a much lower limit than if you send it through a queue first. Uh, and then be aware of infinite loops. Uh, so we got bit by this one, and this becomes, again, this is one of those microservices problems that gets 10x worse uh, with, with, microser or with serverless uh, because we have multiple people writing tiny functions. Those functions rely on each other. They call each other. We ended up getting stuck in an infinite loop. We couldn't figure out why uh, our run times kept going up, but nothing was coming back. Uh, we ended up solving it by uh, deploying a new version of the code that didn't have the loop, but luckily we caught it quickly. Uh, I don't know what happens if you just let one keep running because I don't have infinite money, so I don't want to find out. <laughs> um, I would hope that Amazon would shut that down, but who knows. Uh, so anyway, the best way that we found to avoid it is to tr pass the call stack, basically, which is a good practice anyway because it really helps you with your distributed debugging is if every function has within it saying, I was called by this person and I called this one next. So at least you, you get that trace of here are all the functions that we passed through to get this data. Uh, and then the uh, store your data properly. Uh, you know, don't put anything on a local instance, obviously, that kind of thing, because those local instances only last for a few seconds, uh, which is a nice security benefit. Uh, so that actually takes some workload off of somebody who's managing these infrastructures. You don't have to worry as much about security because your, uh, your, exposed, uh, ex your exposure is, is lower. So using Kappa, some of those difficulties that we've solved are the zipping everything up, deploying, creating the roles, but we still have some other problems. Efficient dependency usage is one of those, right? Uh, local dev environments is another big problem. There's really no good solution about local dev yet. Uh, and making sure that we have the same dependencies 
So we had problems where one developer would do, wouldn't update, wouldn't run their library update, uh, and so they would deploy a function that had a, a, a earlier library, and all of a sudden some code that I wrote stopped working, couldn't figure out why, and it's because somebody had deployed a lower version library. So that's another thing that you have to watch out for. Uh, so again, this diagram of we've got a bunch of people deploying a bunch of stuff to a bunch of places, and I mentioned before about the sizes of the libraries. So if we dive uh, deep into that, we'll see you know, everything else is a lot smaller. So why is that? Here is all of the files involved in those first three functions. And what you'll notice is that there's this library, Boto Core. Uh, you can talk to me later about why we have our own Boto Core, but uh, it's taking up most of that space. And you'll see those big blue blobs happen again and again. So basically, there's three functions that all have to have the same library, very large library taking up a lot of space. How do we solve this? We don't actually have a solution for this. Now, if it were any other library besides like Boto Core, one potential solution is to run a separate function that does whatever that thing is and have everybody else call it. But then you have to get all of your developers onto the same page to make sure they all know that service X exists and does that thing that you guys are all importing. So still, there's no tooling today that exists to help you discover these, but I think that's probably a path we'll go down where we, where we actually walk the source tree and say, hey, six people are importing the same one library. Let's set up a service that does whatever that library does uh, and then tell everybody to call it and then put up a watch to make sure nobody else imports that library. Something like that. And that's kind of part of our next step of our deployment pipeline. So you know, we're gonna make it so that when you check into Git, basically it calls a Lambda function, and that Lambda function will go to spin up an EC2 instance, pull down the code, run all of our analysis, run Kappa, run the deployment, and then log a bunch of data into, send all that back to the Lambda function to log a bunch of data into DynamoDB, uh, maybe send out some alerts, things like that, send back an alert saying, okay, your function is deployed. Still working out the details of this, but this is what we're looking at probably uh, so that you know, the deployment is actually a little bit slower for the developer, but in exchange, we get a lot more insight into what it is that they're doing. So we're essentially making it easier for them by deploying for them, but in reality, we're checking their work, so to speak. So at least that will solve the uh, making sure we have the same dependencies problem uh, and knowing when someone else is going. Uh, but again, that efficient dependency usage is a big problem that we don't have a good solution for. Uh, the local dev environments is another really big problem. You pretty much just have to deploy it and test it in maybe a dev account to see if it works. And more on the subject of testing, in a microservices environment, if you're you know, doing a robust job, then hopefully you're doing a lot of testing where you are testing things like slow network and cutting off communication from one service to another, things of that nature. None of that is, you can do right now if you're using Lambda or these other services because none of them provide a way for you to say, make this just not work randomly 5% of the time uh, and tell me what happens. So as I mentioned before, uh, and I want to mention again, a lot of these are problems that still exist that don't have a lot of solutions. So hopefully, if, as we're working on these solutions, we can share them with each other. Uh, we try to make everything we do open source around tooling and things like that. Uh, and then hopefully I can come back here next year and talk to you all about all of the problems that we've solved with serverless deployments. Uh, so I am done, and I think that's all of my time. So I'll be around if you have questions. Thank you. Give it up for Jeremy.